today's reading is Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. It might help if you kept your Bibles open today because I'm going to be referring to the psalm quite a lot and you can find it on page 570 in the Pew Bibles. And um, if you were here last week or at one of the services last week, it might have felt quite familiar, quite similar really, to Psalm 62, which we looked at last week. And I am going to be making some connections. But this is a very popular psalm in many traditions and contexts. Martin Luther is said to have drawn strength from it when he was given an ultimatum by the authorities who were demanding that he recant what they saw as his heresies. He drew on 46, Psalm 46, and he wrote a hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and he's reported as saying to his friends quite frequently, come, let us sing the 46th Psalm and let them do their worst. More recently, Barack Obama referenced this psalm in a speech that he made on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And in Judaism, it is recited as a prayer for the ending of all wars. So it's very fitting that we are reading it and thinking about it today on Remembrance Sunday and perhaps if you wonder sometimes what to pray for the people of Ukraine and other troubled parts of the world, you could do worse than read this psalm and say it as a prayer to God. So today our title is Strength in Troubled Times. But this psalm particularly really talks about those times when we're fearful. If we look at verse 2, it's saying we will not fear. And I just wonder what are you afraid of? What brings you fear? And I'm not talking about things like spiders or, you know, being in closed spaces, fearful though those are to some people. What are the big things that we are afraid of? Maybe climate change. You know, the seemingly irreversible mess we have made of our world. There were some pretty gloomy messages coming out of COP27 this week about maybe things have gone too far to do much about it. You know, I've always absolutely loved David Attenborough um, programs from the very first one, Life on Earth, which I was watching when I was doing my A-level biology. If you're very clever, you can work out how long ago that was and how old I am. <laughs> it was a long time ago, and I've always absolutely loved those documentaries. I started watching Frozen Planet, too, a few weeks ago, and I had to stop watching it. Um, 
call me, call me a coward, but every week you'd watch this thing and it'd be about this baby seal and you'd watch it growing up and you think, oh, isn't that nice? And then they'd say, 80% of baby seals will not make it through their first year because of climate change. You think, oh. Or 70% of this creature's habitat has been destroyed in the last 30 years. It just got so depressing, I stopped watching. We've made such a mess of the world. And I really, I, I do feel fearful about the future, you know, for, for, for my children, for my grandchildren. What about the political turmoil? All the uncertainty, the strikes, the fear of recession, inflation, questions around migration. And what about the conflicts of the world, the conflict in Ukraine and, you know, all that talk about the threat of nuclear weapons? I mean, how frightening is that? But, you know, none of these are new. Well, nuclear weapons are, I admit. But none of these situations are totally new. If we look at our psalm, in verses 1 to 3, the psalmist is talking about natural catastrophes creation itself in turmoil and yeah we've made it worse but there are always those natural calamities and catastrophes verses five and six give hints of a city under siege political upheaval and verse nine talks about war and conflict so these are all things that humanity has been afraid of they're almost almost over-exaggerated as well, I and mean, they're so strongly stated. How do you respond when, when the psalmist says, we will not fear though the earth give way? Who here has experienced an earthquake? Well, quite a few of us. I've never been in a really strong earthquake. I've been in a pretty strong earth tremor, and it's a bit scary. But the psalmist is saying, well, we won't fear. If the mountains were actually falling around us, if, if, you, if we were standing on a beach watching a tsunami approach, would we be frightened? I think we would. I wonder how do the people of the Ukraine feel when they see the drones appearing overhead, when they're woken in the night as their neighbour's house is blown up? Is Psalm saying, don't be afraid? How can that be? How, how can that be realistic? How can that be possible? Well, what, what the psalmist is doing here is making the exaggeration to make his point. Whatever happens, however terrifying, however unbelievably big and frightening it is, God is bigger and God is more powerful. And it, it kind of reminds me, when I was doing my training to, to be a reader, um, I did a placement with a uh, parish in Worcester and we visited a special school and the vicar um, I was shadowing was talking about God and how big and powerful he is to the children there. And one small boy said, is God more powerful than a T-Rex? And we said, yes, he is. And he thought about this and he said, what about two T-Rexes? <laughs> You know, that was the biggest, scariest, most powerful, frightening thing that little boy could think about, that he could compare God to. And I just wonder, what is the biggest, most frightening, scariest thing in your life? Either a present reality or a future fear. You know, Dave reminded us last week, if you heard his talk, not to bring troubles to God, but to bring God to our troubles, to remind ourselves of the truth about God. So do we tell ourselves when we're frightened that God is more powerful? And God's power is seen in action in verse 10 in our psalm where he says, be still and know that I am God. Sometimes we take that to mean he's saying us to us as individuals, take a moment to be quiet and think about who I am. No, the context here is he's speaking it into war. He's speaking this to the warring worlds and he is saying, be still. In other versions of the Bible, this is translated as cease striving or even lay down your arms. 
That's what this verse is saying. God is saying, lay down your arms. And the result, if that happens, is that God says he will be known as God. We see the same words in the New Testament when Jesus tells the storm to be still. And we're told that the waves died down and the disciples who were with him said, who is this that even the waves and the winds obey him? When God chooses to speak into a situation, when he chooses to still the storms of life, it should cause us awe and respect and help us to remember his power. And that helps us not to fear or to deal with the fear. But God doesn't always remember, doesn't always remove those times of trouble, does he? As we know. And it seems to me that the psalmist doesn't expect it. He reminds himself of who God is, his rock, his strength, always there for them. And then he describes him as a refuge or a fortress three times in just you know, these 11 short verses. What's the purpose of a fortress? Uh, You might recognise this one. Not much of the fortress left, Um, but there it is, British camp. What was the purpose of it? But it's somewhere to retreat to, isn't it, in times of danger. People wouldn't have lived up there all the time, and I always think when I walk up there, it's always windy, isn't it? And there isn't really any water. But the point was you could retreat in there when you needed to in times of danger. You know, when the neighbouring tribe was approaching, you'd grab your sheep and your, your children and your valuables and you'd retreat into the fortress and the gates would be closed to keep you safe. But more than that, the soldiers would man the walls to repel attack. And, uh, you know, if you've ever watched uh, Lord of the Rings too, and uh, the Battle of Helm's Deep, the people are inside and soldiers are on the walls repelling attack. So this is about protection, but it's not just passive, isn't it? You don't just retreat behind the walls and cower there and hope you're going to be safe. There are people actually protecting you. And in this case, it's not just any soldier. It is the Lord Almighty, all-powerful. In the old tradition, uh, the old versions of the Bible, he's sometimes called the Lord of Hosts. Another translation I came across was the Lord of Heaven's Armies. This is a psalm that really pays, by the way, to reading lots of translations because you pick up lots of different things. The Lord of Heaven's Armies. And some of you might remember there's a, there's a story in the book of Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6. Elisha the prophet is in a city surrounded by enemy armies and his servant is terrified. And Elijah prays that he would see what's really going on, and he sees, God says, God opens his eyes, and he sees that they are surrounded by horses and chariots of fire. So protection from our all-powerful God when we retreat into that fortress. Now in verse 5, it says that God is within the city, which is under siege, and she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Why break of day, I wonder? Well, isn't that, and I'd I'd look to uh, those with military experience, but my understanding is that attacks will often be made at dawn. It's when the defenders are tired and worn out, but there's just enough light to see. And we're told that God will help her at break of day. We might be tired. We might be tired from being fearful and, and the challenges we face. God doesn't get tired, does he? God will be there at the break of day, and throughout the day to protect and help. And again, I just remind us that last time Dave encouraged us, you know, once we've thought about who God is, to pour out our hearts. And so that's a really good time, isn't it, sometimes to acknowledge when we are tired, when we are struggling, when we are feeling fearful. And then finally, I want to talk about God's presence in the city. We're told in verse 1 that he is an ever-present help. He's always going to be there. He's ready to be found. And, and And this psalm really is talking very much about the city of God, Jerusalem, and the temple, the holy place where the Most High dwells. 
And it's thought that this psalm would have been used by the pilgrims when they came to Jerusalem for the big feasts of the year. And you can just imagine them walking up into the city, walking up to the temple where, they believe, where, where God dwelt, praising God, thanking him that he was there present with them. They perhaps would have remembered the scriptures in, in 1 Kings 8 when Solomon dedicated the temple and as he brought the Ark of the Covenant into the temple, we're told the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The glory of the Lord filled his temple. And we're told about a river. Well, what's that about? Well, again, the pilgrims would have remembered Ezekiel 47, a stream that, that bubbled up from the throne and a throne of God and ran through the city and out of the gates into the country beyond. The water symbolising God's presence, his grace running out to all peoples. So this psalm is full of the symbolism of God's presence in the earthly city of Jerusalem, in the physical temple where you could be with him. But for us, of course, we look not to the earthly Jerusalem, but to the heavenly Jerusalem. And you can't see it terribly well. Um, but this slide is, is a stained glass window that shows the new Jerusalem. And it's the new heaven and the new earth that we have promised will come into being when Jesus returns. And Revelation 21 gives us a vision of this. John, who, who uh, wrote the book, says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them. We are promised the presence of God, not just on special times of the year, not just in certain places, but always, everywhere, wherever we are, for now, for all eternity. And how do we find that presence of God? Well, going back again to what Dave said last week, he talked about seeking those times of surrendered silence when we actively seek to come into the presence of God and enjoy being with him. So God's power, let's declare the truth of who God is. Let's seek God's protection and pour out our hearts about the things that worry us. And let's seek God's presence through surrendered silence. So where does the psalmist end up? I ask the question, are we not supposed to be afraid? You know, if we've really got the faith, are we never going to be afraid again? No, but I believe that we can grow our confidence in God, whatever happens, whatever situation we're in, whether the storm dies down or not, it's not going to be our strength that gets us through, but his. And I just say again, let's be praying this prayer for the Ukraine, for others, because as Dave said, the world is still a mess, isn't it? But let's seek these three steps and let's continue to look to God for us, for our strength in troubled times. Let's just keep that slide on for a moment and let's just pause just ask that question what is it that you fear most today and just that I think God wants to say you know the Lord of heaven's armies is with you and I just encourage you just to dwell on that for a moment. The Lord of heaven's armies is with you in your troubles. Take courage 
And just let's for a moment dwell on that and allow God to meet us in our fears.